I have a certain emotional investment in this particular topic uh, because it pretty well takes me to the brink of insanity. Uh, you'll understand why I think by the time I finish this lecture. Any event, the problem of Sakarian origins, a doorway to insanity. And, uh, <coughs> By this little Buddhist clip. The Buddha will come in and out of this lecture, as you will see. Okay, uh, when we take a look at the Indo-European languages of the Tarim Basin, they can be divided conveniently into two groups. One, all of the missionary or trade or administrative languages, such as uh, Sogdian or Prakrit or Avestan, Middle Iranian, all types of languages that we can track coming into the Tarim Basin at some later time. In addition, there are two local languages, Saka, or Totonese Saka, uh, an East Iranian language, and Takarian. In terms of Saka, it's basically located in the western part of the Tarim Basin, particularly on the southern part of the Silk Road, uh, around the town of uh, Khotan. Uh, but also to the north around uh, Kashgar. Uh, I've marked the Saka territory there in green. And very briefly, what we can deal with the Saka uh, is, is fairly straightforward. We may be deluding ourselves, but the question of Saka origins in the Tarim Basin does not seem to, uh, to be a tremendously difficult problem. Uh, to begin with, uh, one of the first things we would do is look for some form of external linguistic relations for Saka. That's not difficult from a historical point of view. We have Saka tribes, of course, uh, immediately outside of the, of the Tarim Basin, and we also have their linguistic uh, neighbors in the other uh, Eastern Iranian languages, such as Khorezmian, for example, uh, Bactrian, and so forth. So we can sort of peg origins outside, and from an archaeological point of view, we can also deal, or so we imagine at least, with the, with the Saka, uh, in the sense that we have burials, including royal burials, uh, stretching across the southern part of the Eurasian steppe uh, that have, are either historically identified Saka territory or are in cemeteries such as at Pazirik, for example, in the Altai Mountains, which have generally been presumed to have been some form of Eastern Iranian, such as the Saka. And we can then make tie-ins between the Tarim Basin and these external archaeological sources, such as the site of Yumalak Kum, for example, uh, which was uh, found on the upper reaches of the Karia River in the Tarim Basin, in which we find what otherwise, if we found in the Eurasian steppe, we would recognize as a probable Eastern Iranian <coughs> burial, and certainly comparable with m the more classic burials, for example, such as the tombs at Arjan in, in the Steppeland region. And further, we could go dip deeper into prehistory, into the sort of the Andronovo megacultural horizon from around 2000 to 900 BC, which generally is presumed to carry with it a some form of Indo-Iranian, uh, and by the later period, clearly Iranian uh, ethnic linguistic identity. So, Saka, no great problem, uh, if we're not entirely deluding ourselves about this. Tokarians, this poses a different problem. For the Takarians, what we're dealing with is evidence from about uh, 7,600 documents from about 30 sites, uh, generally in the center and the eastern part of the Tarim Basin. Uh, I'll come a little bit more onto the, the different languages in a second. Key problem, when we compare Takaria with Saka, is that there is no confirmed or universally agreed close linguistic cousin within the Indo-European language family. As anybody here familiar with Indo-European studies is aware, 
you basically divide into two major camps regarding Tocharians. They are either early out, very peripheral, not related to anybody, or you tie them into some form of closer formal relationship with anything from Greek to uh, Germanic uh, or some Balkan language. And there is only one thing that linguists seem to be agreed about. The area that they are least related to tends to be Indo-Arabia. Generally, the division there seems to be fairly deep, to be either argued as sort of spatial, uh, this is the, in the space, Eric Hamps phylogeny, in which you can see Tocharian as sort of a European language and certainly fairly distant from Indo-Iranian, or you might see it temporally in Don Rimge's uh, phylogeny there, where after Anatolian, the Tocharians are the first to split uh, or divide off from the rest of the Indo-European shoot, whereas the Indo-Iranians are one of the most recent. Now, what this results geographically is that the Tocharians then can be seen to be surrounded by Iranians or Indo-Iranians, both linguistically and archaeologically. If you wanted to follow the entire area around, where we locate the Tocharians, they have got Iranians to the north of them, they have them to the west of them, to the southeast, we have Indo-Aryans from the same major stock, and if we wanted to continue around, then we'll hit Tibetan and Han Chinese. So, the Tocharians are sort of locked in in a particular area. Now, if we want to deal with Tocharian origins, primarily as an archaeologist, looking over our shoulder at linguistics, I think there are four things that we have to do. First, we would start with the physical and cultural remains of known historical Tocharian speaking peoples. Starting from there, we would try to move back retrospectively uh, from the historical Tocharians into the prehistoric record to see how far we could follow them there in the Tarim Basin. And then we would begin looking outside the Tarim Basin uh, to trace the immediate origin of the prehistoric Tocharians to some location outside of Xinjiang, outside of, of Western China. And finally, we would need to trace the path of these prehistoric Tocharians to some geographical source that fits into at least somebody's solution or model of Indo-European homelands and Indo-European expansions. So it makes a certain amount of sense in the overall picture. So let's take a look at the first problem here, the physical cultural remains of known historical Tocharian speaking peoples. What do we actually find when we, we go to look for this? Well, we get the Tocharians in all their glory, uh, represented iconographically in Buddhist shrines. Unfortunately, what we find is that the Tocharians present themselves to us either as Buddhist monks dressed in North Indian clothes, or they are represented to us as the so-called Tocharian donors, as warriors dressed up in Sasanian, that is, Iranian dress. We do not see Tocharians through anything but the lens of Buddhism and the ties between Buddhism and the artistic uh, traditions uh, associated with Buddhism and, and contact with, with the West. In short, to try to find and trace the origins of Tocharians with the evidence that we are basically given is sort of tantamount to trying to discuss the origin of the Japanese when the only source we would have had were baseball trading cards. Because we are seeing them outside of their own native culture, whatever that was, before they became uh, Buddhist. So, I'm giving Buddhism sort of a, a hard time here, and I will claw back on that for just a second and take my favorite quote from the Buddha. Believe nothing, no matter where you read it 
or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. So for the rest of this lecture, <clears throat> I'm going to enjoin you to take the Buddha's precepts to heart and even ignore those two famous charlatans, Mallory and Meyer, who will also be in my targets here, even though I just photographed in Xinjiang a Victor Meyer attempting to achieve nirvana in a small Buddhist cell. <coughs> Believe nothing, including stuff that I have written previously. I certainly don't, so there's no reason for you to follow me on this. Okay. When we take a look at what we know about the Tokarians, and we do have a little bit of ethnographic description from the third to the seventh century, for example, regarding the, the city of Kucha, by and large, this is not getting us really anywhere. The material tends to be fairly generic. So let us substitute for a moment geography with archaeology and ask ourselves, okay, where was Tokarian spoken at least? And that depends on what we call the Tokarian manuscripts. And on the basis of which, we can, of course, divide Tokarian into Tokarian A, spoken in, to, pretty well totally confined to the uh, eastern part of the northern tier of the Silk Road. Tokarian B, which stretches entirely along the, the northern uh, route of, 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 the, uh, of the Silk Road. And Tokarium C, or Koranian, which is extraordinarily important and rests entirely on the identification of approximately 100 words in Karostri Prakrit and maybe about a thousand personal names as being related to Tokarium. Now, this is a theory suggested over 75 years ago by Thomas Burroughs. And as it's recently been suggested, it, it was suggested 75 years ago, and in the last 75 years, it has neither been confirmed nor denied. However, from an archeological standpoint, it is extraordinarily important to know whether Tokarian C is indeed a Tokarian language. Because as you can see there, it moves the distribution of Tokarian uh, far beyond the northern Silk Route, but also places it in other territories entirely. Also, the nature of Tokarian C differs very much from Tokarian A and B. It is not a translation, it is administrative documents, indicating you are dealing with a real people uh, who, whose substrate language apparently has worked its way into otherwise Indian administrative documents. Tokarian A and B, which we will wind up having to focus on, is basically the distribution of manuscripts. And these manuscripts are overwhelmingly simply translations of Buddhist texts. And boy, using this is a very dangerous method for a, describing a territory to a given spoken people, uh, language. For example, if I were trying to talk about the distribution of the early Irish on the basis of the earliest Irish manuscripts, the 8th century manuscripts, this is what the distribution would be. Quite clearly, Irish was a language spoken primarily between northern Italy and Germany, and obviously perhaps one of these mad Irish monks wandered off far to the west, but we can dismiss the Book of Armagh. Now remember, we are talking about almost the same cultural milieu. What we are dealing with between either a Tokarian Buddhist monk or an Irish monk, we are talking about peripatetic monks making translations of um, Latin documents in the West, uh, Indian documents in the East, and therefore the distribution of these particular documents is no guarantee that that was the language that was actually spoken in these territories. 
Uh, indeed, it's sometimes been argued, for example, that the Zakarian A documents, by and large, they find themselves where they are because that is where the Uyghurs, the later conquerors of the territory of the Northern Tarim Basin, carried them. And that is basically what we are tracing. So, do we have a core area where we can put our hands on our hearts and suspect, yes, we actually have Tartarian speakers? I've tried to indicate what I think is probably that area. I've marked it there with sort of a circle centered on Kucha, because at least this is an area from which we get Tartarian caravan passes. That is, Tartarian being employed uh, in a secular context in which somebody other than a monk obviously has to be able to read these documents. And therefore, if you can explain that Tokarian is in my core area, then I'm hoping that at least we're, we're chasing real Tokarians uh, and not simply the phantoms of the distribution of, of manuscripts. Uh, in terms of the ethnography, there is very little, as I have said, uh, that can be employed to describe how these Tokarians behaved culturally. Uh, and one example that has been at least uh, offered uh, was the scene of mutilation uh, from uh, the wall paintings at Kizil, for example, people mutilating themselves uh, in part of a ceremony of mourning uh, for the death of someone. Uh, however, we can be able to therefore say, well, the Zakarians engaged in physical mutilation upon the death of someone important. However, the Chinese source, the Han Shu, also described precisely the same behavior among the Saka of Khotan, the Iranians, as indeed does Herodotus, describing the behavior in the Ukraine upon the death of the Scythian uh, king. And generally, this is what we find. The ethnographies are pretty well totally useless. So, how have I achieved my first goal? I failed utterly. I can't even get started. I've had to substitute in the end geographical evidence for archeological evidence to begin the quest for Tokarian origins. So, I will pretend like I have done something and immediately now move to my item two. Trace the remains of historical Tokarians retrospectively into the prehistoric record. First question, how far back do I have to go? When do I think the prehistoric Tokarians were, were alive? If you take a look at the range of dates offered by Tokarian specialists for Proto-Tokarian, the ancestral language to Tokarian A and B, the best guesses for when these two languages split. Uh, by and large, most people, George Wayne, Don Ringe, uh, Georges-Jean Pinot, Jeff Carling, and using uh, a lot of chronology, as Vaclav Blazek is wont to do, uh, generally place it somewhere between around 500 and 1 BC, roughly. The only person offering a considerably earlier date would be Doug Adams, uh, who believed that the separation should actually be considerably earlier, anywhere between 1500 and 500 BC. Uh, what we've got here then is sort of a notional idea when Tokarian should have been probably in the Tarim Basin uh, and begin dividing. And that would have been basically sometime during the Iron Age for most people, or possibly well into the Bronze Age in the case of Doug Adams. So Karian C, because nobody knows its status, has no place in this, so we really aren't discussing if it does belong. We can't actually discuss you know, the earliest common date for all three Tokarian languages. What can we tell from Proto-Tokarian? Well, we can go chasing after Proto-Tokarian culture. If we go through Doug Adams' uh, etymological dictionary, which is currently being revised, may come out fairly soon, uh, we're talking about something over 2,500 words. Uh, and what I'm basically interested in are those items of Proto-Tokarian vocabulary that tells us what cultural words were carried or retained 
by the Tartarians when they entered the Tarim Basin, assuming that the Indo-European homeland is not in China, which has been suggested, of course, by Ake Nare in his, his solution, but I'll leave that aside. Okay, what are we looking at? Uh, I've given here sort of a word list of regarding the Takarian economy. It has plenty of retention of the basic words indicating a pastoral economy, livestock. It has the good old four-footer word. It has several words for cattle. It does the overcaprids quite well. Horse, obviously. Dog. And one nasty word that does not belong, that really should have been shed. Uh, Bakarian B. Shual, pig, domestic pig. It occurs clearly in context, uh, in Tokarian B, with few contexts it does occur, indicating a domestic pig, pig excrement, and things like that. And it is problematic. Uh, the only way we're going to be able to explain this generally is assume that the word uh, once meant domestic pig, then it became wild pig on the way to the Tarim Basin, and then was reassigned to the domestic pig when they encountered pigs from basically Chinese society. Uh, immediately to the east of the Tarim Basin in Gansu, you have major pig uh, raising societies. Uh, we also have a whole series of words associated with arable agriculture, words for plow, tilling the soil, and various words for grains, seeds, uh, the word for bread, apparently coming from an earlier word for wheat. Um, many of these terms have to be fairly vague. Uh, millet is a major crop in the Tarim Basin with early domestication from China. And in this case, it appears to be uh, semantic shifts in the Tarim Basin, in Tokarian at least, coming from words earlier meaning barley or something like that, and then being simply reassigned to millet. We get a series of words for animal products, milk, animal fat, grease, honey. We get a few words regarding textiles, which is really terrible that we have so few, because this is one area in which we get total preservation of textiles. Uh, we would love to have words for pattern weaving and things like that there. And then some generic terms for you know, weapons. Among the metals, gold and silver are preserved in Tokarian. And regarding transport, the entire semantic field there, wagon, wagon chassis, harness, uh, perhaps wheel, spokes, uh, all of these uh, can be found, as well as two words for, for boat. Regarding architecture, we get a general word for enclosure, village, house, door, and bed, and some words associated with uh, social organization. This ends the inherited cultural vocabulary, words which at least the Tokarians had <coughs> from Indo-European, which they did not shed, however they got to the Tarim Basin, which they still retain. However, <coughs> there are a number of other words which are culturally important, and these basically come from Saka. Words for iron, weapon, knife, axe, army, a flax garment, and also words associated with social organization and ideological belief, king, glory, share, possession. Two of the most critical items of material culture uh, are argued to come in much later. The word for brick is supposedly from Sogdian and the word for canal is from Bactrian. And therefore they may not have bred, uh, irrespective of how early we find bricks and things in the Tarim Basin, uh, the words themselves we don't seem to recover from anything until maybe the early centuries AD. The late Xavier Tremblay has argued that the earliest stratum of Iranian loanwords in proto tokarian is Old Sakan, and that is to be explained by meetings between the Tokarians and the Saka within the Tokar in the, in the Tarim Basin. He specifies that it involves a, there's no evidence that these loans involve a geographically remote Iranian language. And so what he is arguing here 
is that on the way to the Tarim Basin, there is no evidence that Tocharian picked up Iranian loans. It only absorbed them when it had arrived in the, in the Tarim Basin. Uh, and this puts the Tocharian, basically, whatever route they got there, sort of isolated from Iranians. Uh, this can be challenged, because I'm emailing back and forth with Doug Adams, that Tremblay's old Sakhan is very close to simply proto-Eastern Iranian in the first place, so we not be, might be able to distinguish between a word uh, in pro proto-Eastern Iranian versus that of, uh, uh, of Sakhan itself. Uh, among the words, perhaps I think the most diagnostic would certainly be the development in Iranian from the Indo-European word for you know, an edged instrument coming to mean sword, and in Khwarazmian and in Saka coming to mean iron or steel, and this is the word that is lent into Takarian to mean iron as well. Now, the nice thing about that is iron begins to appear at about 1000 BC. Since Saka and Keresmian seem to be sharing the same word for iron, it looks like the Saka may have brought that same word, therefore, into the Tarn Basin from 1000 BC onwards, something like that. And the Saka knew iron, therefore, perhaps before they entered the Tarn Basin, and this might imply that the Tokarians were already there if they did not pick up the word for iron until that point. Just a loose bit of logic, but one I suppose could try to run with it. Okay, from an archaeological point of view, what are your potential Iron Age Tokarians then? Your potential proto tokarians And so, I pop back the linguistic map, although now plotted on it are the names of certain archaeological sites Bozdung and uh, Chungbok and, and Potterville, for example. Uh, and I first must deal with one hideous problem of archaeology. It has been suggested in a book that only appeared earlier this year by Leonid uh, Shvechkov on the origin of the Tokarians uh, that we can find them quite clearly by simply examining the ceramics of the Tarim Basin, that the area of which the Tokarian A and B occupied were areas of painted wares, whereas plain, unpainted gray wares basically coincide with the territory of the Saka. So Saka, boring gray wares, Tokarian, bright painted wares. The problem with employing this particular type of logic, which for him needs in a trail uh, back uh, to Ferdana is that just about everybody else would argue that that painted pottery is simply represents the spread of native Chinese pottery to the west. It's an eastern west spread. It is found on sites. We can follow the dates of them. Uh, and therefore, uh, the painted ware distribution comes from Gansu, and we cannot look upon this basically as an ethnic marker of Tokarians from wherever they may have come from, unless you imagine that the Tokarians came from Gansu, from, from further east in China, and moved to the west. On top of which, the metallurgy that we find on these sites of the Iron Age is basically comparable to the same types of metal types we find in the Eurasian steppe zone. That is the area that we would normally said it was Iranian. So we're in a hideous problem from an archaeological point of view because all of the major markers of material culture are associated with people who we already exclude from being Tokarians, either Chinese or Iranians. If we take a look in this area, roughly the core area, we have basically a series of cemeteries which some would like to relate to one another, others don't. Uh, there are certain common features of them. <clears throat> they, some of them can be quite large with burials in, in the hundreds. Uh, Karigal, the largest, 
the burials that we find of men accompanied by their horses. If we go north of the Tian Shan Mountains uh, that block the Tarim Basin from, from the Eurasian steppe, uh, we find precisely the same type of burials in cemeteries that we would otherwise regard as Iranian. And the problem that we have here is that all of the sites south of the Tian Shan in the foothills of these mountains look like sites from the Eurasian steppe and look therefore like Iranian sites. What this means then is that the Iron Age proto-Tokarians of the first millennium BC are either hiding under the parking lot of KFC in Kucha and other oasis towns, and we have never seen them or never found them, or they are absolutely indistinguishable from the Saka. And we cannot tell a Tokarian from a Saka in terms of their material culture or cultural behavior. In short, in the sixth century AD, the Dakarians were already masters of disguise. They dressed up and pretended like they were Sasanians. On one hand, we would hope this might get us closer to finding out you know, an original people, but the two major sites are basically useless. Uh, one of them, Shintala, for example, is the only site south of the Tian Shan where we get both metal artifacts of the steppe are found with gray ceramics of the steppe. Again, we're in Tokarian-speaking area, but everything about it is screaming Saka, in so far as we can see. And at the other site, at uh, Kaladun, uh, its connections, its cultural connections, tend to be with the West, particularly Ashtala, in the Western area, which is very clearly in Saka territory. We move back a little bit further. In short, we're trying to go back further and further in the archaeological record to see what does a real Tokarian look like when he's not dressing up like what we think is an Iranian. And the earliest possible horizon uh, was discovered early in the 20th century, at least it takes its name from a site at that time, uh, first discovered by a grave robber who worked with Sven Hedin, uh, Erdek, uh, portrayed here, Sven Hedin's uh, description of him, uh, who once saw a fabulous site, and then it simply disappeared, uh, and that many years, when he was about 70 years old, the Swedish expedition, led by Folke Berman from Uppsala, dragged Erdek back out into the desert to find this miraculous cemetery, uh, which was then called Erdek's Cemetery, when they finally, finally managed to, to, to find it. Um, also named Small River, or Small River Five Cemetery. And Berriman did some small excavations there. You can see some of the scenes from the cemetery and one of the mummies tipped out of a coffin uh, by, by, by grave robbers. Uh, Berriman excavated the site, uh, published it, and it sat, you know, pu published in English, no problem, but the Chinese paid no attention to it until someone finally got around to translating Berman's site report into Chinese that set off a flurry of activity and the site was once again rediscovered and fully excavated. And what we now know is that we have a horizon, an early Bronze Age horizon dating from around 2000 to about 1600 BC, which we can call the Shao He, that simply means small river horizon. It is primarily concentrated with a number of cemeteries or, or individual burials uh, near the dried up lake of Lapnur uh, in, the, in the far east, the ancient kingdom of Koran. However, it also has produced an outlier something like 500 kilometers east, uh, sorry, west across the Tarim Basin at the site of Beifong Moody, uh, across the Tarim Basin. <clears throat> the site of Xiaohe is a marvelous site, 
the mound itself is about seven and a half meters high, which is entirely covered with sand, measures about 40 by 80 meters. The burials were arranged in five layers. Uh, the graves marked by poplar posts, of which 190 were still standing, up to a height of four meters long. Just a few quick scenes from the excavation uh, that was undertaken by uh, Abdurrasul Idris of the, of the Xinjiang Archaeological Survey. Uh, you can see the post standing there, where the, the coffins being uncovered in their different layers. Just to take, follow one coffin. Uh, normally tamarisk or various seeds placed over a leather skin. Quite clearly, it seems that the, the cattle were butchered uh, at the site and the skins put on while fresh so that they would contract and tighten over the lids. The lids, as you can see here, wooden planks covering over what otherwise would pass for a boat-shaped coffin in Scandinavia. And total preservation of these people dating back nearly 4,000 years. Uh, this is one of the more spectacular here. Uh, woman completely dressed, wrapped in a shroud. Her clothes, uh, as you can see, would give just as much of offense as some of the Danish fog bodies did when they were uncovered. Uh, the string dresses and things, also here in, in the Tarim Basin. Uh, large fur hats. I've included a small little uh, figurine, frequently found, completely buried in one of these. Uh, and you may be able to see a series of little round things. These are balls, and in the uh, shrouds, uh, they would be tied up to small little balls, and the balls would be filled with either seeds of wheat or of ephedra. Uh, and our lady here reconstructed as the beauty of Shao He. Now, totally spectacular cemetery. Uh, however, uh, plunderers managed to discover a, another one of these far, far to the, uh, the west, the site of Beifong Moody. And these were some of the first photographs taken by the first Chinese archaeologist to get in. And they are absolutely comparable in every way to what was found at Beifar Moody, although the cemetery is slightly smaller. Uh, the plunderers having strewn the ground with human body parts and everything else. So, Shaoha Horizon. Do these equal the proto-Tokarians? Proto well, either they're going to be the proto-Tokarians, or they belong to some other Western group, because the people physically are... are, are Westerners in, in, the, in the broadest sense, speaking a totally unknown language, and of course, whenever you have an unknown language anywhere within a couple of thousand miles of Pakistan, you grab for Vershovsky immediately, because uh, you want it to be related to something. Uh, you notice I'm totally quiet about the Journal of Indo-European Studies article attempting to describe Vershovsky as an Indo-European language. You can take that or leave it, depends on, you know, uh, how you feel about that. Uh, a key problem here is that you can see from the green circle, the Shafa sites are outside the area of Takari and A and B. So how in the world can they fit into the story? They only fit into the story if Takari and C is a, uh, a, a, actually indeed a Takarian language. So either Porto Takarian, remnants of Takari and C come from, the, from that area, or they are simply a background population for other late Bronze Age immigrants coming in to the uh, Tarim Basin that that's a, do not have any particular relationship uh, with the Tokarians. If Shaohe Horizon is Tokarian, we would expect it to have, and I've just given some of the basic list of items there, those marked in red, they automatically tick the boxes. They certainly have cattle galore. Uh, sheep, goat, domestic cereals, uh, and some evidence of gold. Uh, they do not have real vehicles found from the burials themselves, but shortly afterwards, within the Tarim Basin, we have remains of real vehicles at Wupu, and we have them from an earlier period in, uh, in Mongolia, so it would be very odd if they didn't have real vehicles. And silver is found almost at about the same time from a, another site in the Tarim Basin, Jiangshan Belu, 
uh, further to the north of, of, of Loch Noor. Uh, the horse has not occurred there, and of course the pig uh, is not found. Wild boar is native to the Tian Shan Mountains, and a little bit of pig has turned up in the Carrier River, so that couldn't be excluded. And the horse is therefore the only animal lacking uh, so far. Uh, so they tick many of the boxes, at least. So uh, what I've done here is try to trace the immediate origin of the prehistoric Bakarian to a location outside of Xinjiang. Well, I can only do that if I assume I've got some form of anchor, and so I'm going to pretend that Xiaohe meets at least some of the minimum requirements for being proto tarkarian And here is where things began to get particularly nasty. Uh, if you follow the sort of orange box there, what you'll observe is that the Tarim Basin, one of the clearest routes into the Tarim Basin from outside is immediately north, and that is the Jimgar Basin. A uh, somewhat smaller basin and not quite as nasty in terms of uh, its, its ecology. Uh, and it then is further connected further north with the Altai Mountains and the Eurasian Steplands. If we take a look at the early Bronze Age of what little we know in the Jungar Basin, uh, we find cemeteries, uh, lots of pottery, and the problem with the Shaofa horizon is we have no single pot whatsoever found on any of these early sites. We find baskets, we don't find pots. And it's generally now been argued that it's very difficult to see any cultural connection between the Jungar Basin and the Tarim Basin that might explain these earliest Westerners coming into the, into the Tarim Basin. On the other hand, if we take the blue box, we can relate what's going on in the Jungar Basin to the Eurasian steppe and to greater Indo-European homeland theories, the, the steppeland theory in particular, because Chinese archaeologists are in agreement that the Afanashevo culture does have connections with the Jungar Basin, and that we can compare Afanashevo pottery, and in particular even these so-called censers, footed vases, uh, between sites of the Afanashevo culture, and they're also found in, in Ukraine and in Russia as well, uh, and the site of Shamershak, uh, uh, the, the major cemetery of, of, in the Jungar Basin, uh, producing somewhat similar things. Burial posture tends to be somewhat similar as well. We do not find any pottery in this early horizon, in the early Bronze Age of, of the Tara Basin. Now, to steal a map from David Anthony, uh, the reason why this is so critically important is that in my book on the Tara mummies and other people as well, have basically thought that the way of explaining the Tarkarians, one of the easiest, would to see them as the Afanashevo culture, the easternmost extension of what we regard as the, the Western steppe cultures. And the Afanashevo culture is producing some horribly early dates, although the earliest can be disputed, but they can run from around 37 to 2500 BC. It is followed by the Akunyavo culture around 2500 to 1900 BC, which incidentally has a lot of rock art, so you may be interested in paying attention to the next Journal of Indo-European Studies article uh, by Ludmilla Sokolova trying to relate it to uh, uh, cultural spread uh, throughout Central Asia. There is generally recognized a break after that, and then we have occupation by the Andronimo culture in this region, which, as I've indicated, is generally presumed to be Indo-Iranian. The Karasuk culture follows. Nobody's quite sure what to do with that one ethnically. And then finally, the Tagar culture. Most people regard it as Eastern Iranian. Some people regard it as proto samoyedic or something like that. Now, because so much hangs on it, I and others, such as Amelia, uh, sorry, uh, such as uh, Elena, uh, Kuzmina, uh, engage in what I regard as a little bit of Chinese chess, Qing Chi, in which you have a chess piece called the Pao, the cannon, which 
rather than simply takes a man, it has to jump over one man and land. And this is what I do effectively here. Forget the Jungar Basin. How can we compare the Apanashavo with Shaohe and assume we simply don't know enough in between? Well, <clears throat> does this give us a hint as to where these people are coming from? There is some ancient DNA analysis of the Shaohe burials. Uh, among the females, the predominant mitochondria, in terms of mitochondrial DNA in general among the burials, the primary type is C4, which, if we look at the current distribution of it, tends to look like uh, native certainly to Asia uh, and can also be seen particularly concentrated in Siberia. Uh, how much you want to make out of modern distributions, uh, it, this does not necessarily occur any movement of the women, at least, from, from the West. But the males, have good old R1A1A of uh, the Y chromosome. This, I'll be very interested in hearing the later lecture on, uh, on DNA because this is one of those absolute pain in the arse uh, haplogroups, which by some are argued clear evidence that the Indo European homeland is in Eastern Europe because of the high modern concentration of the R1A1A there, and others arguing nonsense that does not prove anything, uh, and indeed you have more and deeper uh, claims of it uh, within India, and if it meant anything, uh, it would be suggesting populations migrating from India. So where this arguments particularly stand on this particular group one way or the other, difficult to say. I don't know where it originated, but it is found in ancient DNA among Bronze Age populations in the Yenisei region, which as you can see, at least is there north of, of Shaohe, and might therefore indicate, again, a movement from the north to the south. In terms of the archeological comparison, I can make them, but I could not put my hand on my heart and say that I necessarily believe them. The Afanashimo culture has circular enclosures around its, its graves. At the site of Kerrigal, one of these Shaohe sites, and indeed the earliest of them, we have, needless to say, no stone enclosures, but we do have timber circles. Uh, this would be great, except that the Afanashimo culture should end 500 years before the Shaohe horizon. <coughs> That therefore, the background culture should have been the Acunyavo, and there they basically used rectangular enclosures. So, comparing a rectangular stone enclosure to a round wooden enclosure is, is sort of grasping at straws. The Xiaohe cemeteries have a variety of different types of totems. Uh, particularly spectacular are these posts with uh, ox skulls tied to them, and normally, uh, cattle dung, mounds of cattle dung at their base, uh, might be compared with the types of things we find in the Acunyavo culture where we routinely get long, tall uh, stone posts completely covered with totems. Uh, alas, not ones that I can see as cattle. Uh, you get a lot of faces on these that have been regarded as shamanistic. The one thing that the Shaohe culture does have is the burials of very tiny micro masks, of which some of these I try to illustrate here. And in the Acunyavo culture, we even have somewhat similar micro masks carved out of stone that have been found accompanying burials. The use of metal in the Shaohe culture is truly bizarre. Although the posts have been cut, cut by what have been identified as bronze axes, we find no evidence of bronze tools. The only evidence of bronze, and it's abundant enough, is simply small slivers of bronze that have been pounded into the tips of posts. And the closest thing for this random use of, of bronze I can find is the occasional use of staples 
in Afanasiabo wooden vessels, which I found once in a catalog of Afanasiabo material. By and large, this is crap, but it's the best I can do archaeologically. So then we compare here to Karian and Afanasiabo. How does Afanasiabo stack up as an Indo-European culture that could be the background to the movement of Tokarians into the Tarim Basin. Uh, things marked here in red indicate where it ticks the, the box, so it certainly has cattle and sheep, goat. It has some evidence of horse and dog. Uh, it does not have domesticated pig, uh, but there has been a little wild boar found from the, uh, the Altai region, so we could, we could probably count that. But when it comes to agriculture, both the Afanasiabo and the Acunabo culture reveal nothing other than perhaps the processing of some wild grain. And this is absolutely critical, because as I've indicated, Proto-Tokarian should have been carrying the names of domesticated plants, arable agriculture, and everything else into the Tarim Basin. And if we look at other items of the Afanasiabo culture, many of these things we simply can't find or, or we're going to be unlikely to find. Uh, but at least Afanasiabo has the gold and silver, and Afanasiabo also tips at least some of the, the items regarding transport. In terms of uh, enclosures, well, we only find them around burials. It's been suggested that this implies that they were surrounding the very few settlements that that have been excavated, but uh, this can't be, can't be demonstrated. If we want to compare Shaohe, what we know in the Torah Basin, with the Afanashevo, and compare how each of them fit, each of them tick some, but none of them tick all the boxes. By and large, in the case of Shaohe, I think we can assume it probably ticks everything that we absolutely need. Afanashevo, the key element, is domestic cereals. It has no evidence of domestic cereals, and because of that, we have the totally weird situation that the earliest horizon looks more like the Karians than anybody on the steppe lands who should have been their ancestors. So, the critical problem here are that the Eurasian steppe cultures, going to the Altai, the Jigar, the Tarim Basin, however we want to play this game, there does not seem to be any evidence of agriculture throughout the vast Eurasian steppe lands before the Late Bronze Age or the Iron Age. And so the Tokarians, if you follow this, and this is actually what archaeological evidence reveals over time that the Karians should not have made it as part of the steppe expansion. They would need a different trajectory. Or they come through the Andronimo horizon uh, somehow. So, I'm going to give you our summary of ignorance. One, a lack of evidence for the Karians independent of some form of international style means that we really have no point to even begin the discussion of Tukarian origins with. All we have is a geographical distribution of the documents and the validity of Tukarian C. If you don't have a PhD and this is the area you're interested in, for God's sakes, would somebody tackle this problem? Because it's been sitting there 75 years. Tukarian studies has moved on an awful lot since the time of, of you know, a, a 19, late 20s and 30s articles, and we should be able to deal with it far, far better. Uh, and therefore, I think it would be well worth taking a look at again. During the Late Bronze Age or the Iron Age, so far as I can see, it's impossible to distinguish between a Tokarian and a Saka, on, at least on archaeological grounds. It may be a problem of our paradigm, our assumptions regarding Eurasian steppe cultures, such that we have got to the point that everybody that we see is Iranian unless they can prove otherwise. 
Uh, in any event, the reconstructed lexicon does not distinguish between Iranians and Tokarians. I try to think of, is there any element of Indo-Iranian culture that might distinguish them from what we know of Tokarians? And you can probably play the, the Soma Gambit. You have Soma or Halma in, in Iranian, sacred drink. And if you want to follow the evidence of the BMAC culture and assume that it was a mixture of ephedra and things like that, uh, it will give us the type of result that we absolutely do not want because in the Tarim Basin, the earliest horizon continually uses ephedra. So if you used ephedra as a marker of Iranianness or Indo-Iranianness, then the earliest horizon would be Iranians as well. So you would gain nothing that way. Uh, if the Dakarians cannot be anchored within the Tarim Basin, it's going to be very difficult, at least, to derive them from outside because we have no idea what we're trying to tie from one arrow to another. Uh, the Dakarians look like they absorbed uh, Iranian culture on the steppe, uh, but little language, if you imagine that they had a late movement, or the Dakarians the Tarim before Iranian uh, arrived there, uh, and then later absorbed the material culture. Or we have to imagine we've still not found a single Tokarian in the Tarim Basin. They're still hiding from us there. <laughs> we have three models for explaining Tokarian origins. None of them work. The step model is great because it puts Tokarians on the periphery. If you'd like to believe that Tokarians separated very early from Indo-European, if you want to associate them with Alphanashevo, and that means that the Korean does not need to meet an Iranian until it gets in the Tarim Basin, as Xavier Tremblay was, was trying to indicate. Against it is that the Afanasiabo culture, while popularly derived from the European steppe culture, that is not universally held, and we know both David and I, uh, uh, Eurasian steppe experts, who would argue that Afanasiabo has nothing to do with Yamnaya and the other cultures of of the European steppe. And the steppe cultures all lack cereals. Tokarian must have cereals. If, if, if you can prove either from an archeological point of view that I am wrong there, I would be very, very gratified. If you can prove from a linguistic point of view that we have greatly exaggerated what Tokarians retained regarding the cereal vocabulary, that would also be very nice. But as I see it now, it pretty well has to stand. Takarians knew cereals, the steppe did not know cereals. Uh, and finally, the steppe derivation of the earliest Tarim cultures, the Shalha horizon, uh, is archaeologically weak. Shalha horizon, we have no idea where it came from. Or you can follow a steppe model if you want to imagine that the Takarians somehow were part of the Afanasiabo uh, uh, Andronabo phenomenon. They looked like Iranians. They simply managed to retain a totally different language, sorry, across the Eurasian steppe, come in. If they come in late enough, they could carry cereal agriculture. If they're only coming in by, let's say, about 1,000 BC, can't prove it. We've just simply mistaken them for Iranians. Uh, the problems uh, with this is sort of the logical, how in the world can you live completely surrounded by Iranians, travel across the face of what we think is Iranian society without picking up the Iranian language until you've arrived in the Tarim Basin. And finally, you shift the homeland to Central Asia, for example, as, as Schwarzkopf has tried to do. Tokarians would certainly have a less distance to travel, if you have a Central Asian homeland, you can draw arrows any way you want and have any phylogeny you want of Tokarian vis-a-vis -vis other Indo-European languages. And there, Tokarians can be associated with the spread of cereals from Central Asia to China, along basically a mountain route and then into, into Western Tarim Basin. Against this is, I think, a Central Asian homeland for the Indo-Europeans completely sucks when it comes to explaining the European languages. Every attempt to start the homeland in Central Asia requires 
all of the Europeans to gain their language sometime by the Middle Bronze Age by a movement totally you know, unrecorded coming around the Caspian Sea, moving across into Europe from that direction, which I think is an extraordinarily difficult uh, item to sell. I contemplated that the only way of solving this problem was once again take a leaf from the Buddha and that I would sit down under a Bodhi tree and ask myself where did the Takarians come from and sit there until I had enlightenment. <laughs> I became a Buddha and I understood it. I am, however, enough pessimist to imagine that if I did so, I would simply starve to death first. Thank you. This is working. Well, the rest of you are technically our lunch break has already started, but I'm sure we will, there are lots of um, questions. Yes, very yeah. enlightening indeed. Um, we have the people, the Uchi people in, in uh, western Kazakhstan, in Gansu area, the Beta Kusens. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, we have the Uchi people in, in Gansu area, yeah. uh, which I believe are, are do they, they speak into European, that's really the question here. Do you, you, you haven't mentioned them here? Uh, no, I deliberately avoided mentioning them there. Uh, I think the Uchi, even if they are Tokarian speakers, get us nowhere. I will try to <laughs> very briefly try to explain why. Uh, what we know of the Yuchi, first, what we know of the language. In the Tarim Basin, we know nothing. There's no such thing as a Yuchi document. The only evidence for the Yuchi language, if you want to accept it, are some words that enter Bactrian when the Yuchi expanded to the west and entered Bactria, which, according to Nicholas Sims Williams, if you look at those words which we think are Yuchi, those were Iranian words. And therefore, uh, what you normally get is, well, the Yuchi originally spoke Tokarian, but on the way to the west, they picked up Iranian languages and arrived there speaking Iranian. For example, the route from, from China to, to the west would have taken them uh, through the Jungar Basin to the Ili Mountains, where we assume that they're talking basically with Iranian, so they, they absorb Iranian words. So never at any moment can we prove for sure that the Yuchi spoke Tokarian. But setting that all aside, what we're dealing with is a migration from east to west dated to was 162 BC, something like this, too late to explain the people who occupy the territory where we have Tokarian manuscripts. In other words, even if the Yuchi spoke Tokarian, they are pastoralists, whereas so far as we can see, the earliest Tokarians dating from uh, uh, the, the time that the Yuchi were pastoralists are probably occupying urban settlements, waiting for Buddhism or already beginning to accept Buddhism. So they're only part of the general Tokarian world at best. And the only way you can relate them to a place outside, obviously, is to go back to Henning and then to uh, Ivanov and assume some relationship between the word Yuchi and uh, Guti and have them come from Mesopotamia. And that type of game just drives me totally crazy I, uh, because that's just simply drawing an arrow from one area to the next without anything whatsoever uh, to substantiate it. Uh, so I've written an article on this and I've tried to go through all the arguments regarding Yuchi. And with the best will in the world, I simply do not think they get us very far even if they spoke to Kari. Right, okay, it was just, when you mentioned this painted way of ceramics and, and you mentioned the pig also, I mean, yeah. we're pointing to a, an Eastern influence, so, but thank you. The, the, the painted work, yes, comes earlier than the Uchi expansion. 
But as we trust on Yeah, but, but we, we don't know the, the origin of the Uchi, I suppose. No, no. I mean, we know the end of them, but... No, they're, they're just an ethnic name, yeah. Yes, uh, can you... Um, I should ask everyone to speak in the microphone, please. Uh, you'll be handed a microphone right now. Otherwise, it won't be recorded. Thank you. I have uh, <coughs> three clarifying questions. Uh, first of all, you talk about Saka. Is that uh, Sokteni uh, from Soktia? No, the, the Saka, Kotni Saka, uh, well represented in Kotan. It was the, the actual language in the southern part of the Taran Basin, over a very broad area. Well, the picture you showed, one of the first uh, uh, overheads, uh, when uh, you have some green circles. Uh, yes. I saw Saka was uh, where Tajikistan is today. Right, yes. Historically, that is putting the ethnic identification <laughs> of the tribe called Saka uh, on the map, whereas we actually have no Sogdian, yes. Uh, in that territory. It, it, there's probably not that much difference between Sogdian and, and, and Saka. Okay, the next question was uh, about those pictures of the uh, pictures you showed. Yes. Uh, are those faces the faces we have or is it just imagination? No, they, they are Western faces, shall we say. They will have beards. Uh, if this is what you're talking about. The problem with the faces is that if you go through the Buddha shrines, uh, because of uh, uh, Muslim beliefs regarding the showing of the face, they are almost invariably have their eyes and parts of the faces scraped out. No, I'm talking about a picture where you showed them in uh, <coughs> Sassanid's clothes, yes. and on the right side you showed them in uh, Buddhist. Uh, yes. Is that a real picture? Is yes. that yes? yes? Because they don't look Iranian at all. They look very much uh, Mongolian. No, no. One one figure was Chinese. One was an Asian monk, and the other one was a Western monk. Okay. The Western monk is the ugly-looking one. <laughs> on the right side, yeah. Yes, on the right side. The Chinese said that the Westerners resembled the cerulean monkeys. Yeah, they said yes, that. in other words, yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we are particularly ugly in our... Well, I can speak for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the last question was, again, back to that overhead with you, where you had <coughs> Saka showing where Sultania is. Yes. And you had on the east of Caspian Sea, northeast of Caspian Sea, written Iranians all over the yes. world. What uh, era are we talking about when you're showing that? Iron Age. Uh, therefore, you're probably talking about around the 7th century to the 1st century BC uh, in the uh, certainly in, in the western part of the steppe. So when you say Iranians, you include uh, Scythians then? Uh, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Saka and Scythian are identical. That, that, that's simply what you call a Scythian in the west, you call a Saka in the east. There would, we would not make any distinction between the two. Okay, because... Okay. Therefore, when we have what little evidence of the Scythian language as an Iranian language, and the same thing happens with Saka names, what few Saka names that we, we have. Yeah, because Herodotus says that uh, um, the Persians and Scythians could speak easily with each other. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Do we know anything about the climatic circumstances in the, in the Taklamakan, uh, in, the, in the Bronze Age or the Iron Age? Was the climate, climate, uh, climate better at that stage? Uh, somewhat better, because what we can see is that a number of these sites are found now on areas of dried river beds, dried lake beds, and things like that. Uh, I showed you the site of Yumalak Kum, for example, where you had sort of an Iranian-type 
burial on the Carrier River. It is now many, many kilometers from where there's any water in the Carrier River. And what people, geomorphologists have been able to do is trace the, the continual desiccation of the Tarim Basin. So it has been getting worse and worse, because otherwise you have a lot of problems to explain in sand dunes, getting four meter posts of poplar and cattle and all of the rest of this. It's very difficult to you know, understand. This contrasts very greatly against the environment as it is today. Yeah, so it has changed considerably. Yeah, would it be possible that if the Tocharians were there in the middle, <laughs> that they split up? So one uh, group went to the south and another group went to the north or something? Like yes, that? yes. I, I mean, how the, to begin with, is Tocharian city. <laughs> if it is Tocharian, then, then it, it, it does, it, it raises a lot more interesting questions on the, on the distribution then. <laughs> And if Takarian Sea is really Takarian, then almost all the things that you see in museums as mummies are Takarian. <laughs> well, I think we should probably stop now. So, may I thank you for this very uh, illuminating and enlightening lecture? It was a great pleasure. Thank you.